That is pretty good. Our holy and merciful Father God who loves us. Jesus Christ had bore the judgment that we were supposed to face and cleansed us through his precious blood. And we thank you so much for sending Jesus Christ to die for us, Lord, and allowing us to have the eternal hope in heaven. And for all those who have gathered here, who have received salvation through your precious through Jesus' precious blood. We thank you for allowing us to gather here today to listen to your word and to have fellowship, Lord. But uh, there are those who aren't able to gather here physically, but there are those who are gathered at their homes listening to today's word. Please be with them in each individual place and provide them with your abundant grace and love, Lord. For all the churches that are nation and worldwide, we know that you're with them and protecting them. And especially in these end days, the end times, there are many afflictions and trials, but we believe that you're with them and protecting them and guiding them so that they may be able to live fervently for you and also to be used for the preaching of the gospel. Please protect the brothers and sisters, both spiritually and physically, so that they may be able to fulfill your works and also to restore the health of those who are ill. And please allow us to be able to be used preciously in these end times and continuously to provide mercy to those lost souls so that not one soul will be lost especially in this time, provide us with the, your words that you would like us to learn. And for our Lord who bears all of our weaknesses, please continue to uphold us with your mighty hands and give us wisdom and allow us to be able to give us the courage and ability to live more boldly and courage courageously for you. We ask that the Holy Spirit guides us from the beginning until the end, and we pray in the name of Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to listen to the hymn that's prepared by the choir.
Thank you very much. Even the hymn and the choir is through online. Yeah, looks like we've advanced a lot. I'm not sure if we've advanced or actually regressed. Being offline is quite uh, much better, but I hope that in the near future, because of all the coronavirus issues, I hope that all those things will return back to normal. Thank you for the choir for preparing the hymn for us today. Thank you. Let's look at the scriptures. Let's search the scriptures in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. I'll read this, or let's read this one verse together. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Let's read this verse together. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. In the previous Sunday, we learned about be led by the Holy Spirit. Be Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We learned that. Uh, we learned the lessons through Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. And after you receive salvation, you have earned eternal life and become a child of God. Receive the Holy Spirit, and also, while you live in this world, you are a Christian. Being a Christian means that you are a born-again person, that you have earned eternal life, and then you have became a child of God, and you are a man of God. And that person is um, who Christ lives within. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Although many people can attend church for many decades, all they are, if they receive, if they do not receive salvation, all they are are church go goers and religious people. You cannot just say to anyone that they are born again Christians or Christians. And the way to tell if a person was born again or not is through their their life and whether they bear fruits or not. So many things to their life will be evident and witnessed to others, um, whether they are born again or not. Just like trees, you cannot tell when they are young whether they are a fig tree, an apple tree. However, when they continuously grow, their true nature will, continue, will um, be evident and you can see the, the fruits that will uh, bear and you can see what kind of tree they are as a good tree cannot bear bad fruit neither can uh, men gather grapes from thorn bushes or thistles so neither can a bad tree bear good fruit either so a person's life tells us who that person life is or who that person truly is so we um, are able to bear fruit for the glory of God so when we first receive salvation and are born again shortly afterwards we'll be able to see whether that person truly receives salvation and have eternal life and have Christ in that person Shortly afterwards, slowly we can see those evidences. You know, after receiving salvation, that person won't uh, all of a sudden change into an angel. However, slowly and surely that person will transform and you can see the form of Christ in their life. There must be transformation in their life. So therefore... You say you, are, you became a Christian, received salvation, received salvation. That is an amazing, amazing thing. Is that just anything you should 
take easily so easily no jesus christ has said you are not of this world but i chose you out of the world although we live in this world however we are not of this world prior to receiving salvation we are actually uh, living under the sway of the wicked one the devil however we have become trans uh, transferred from the authority of the devil to our lord's bosom so we are not those who are of this world anymore although our physical bodies dwell in this earth but our spirits belong in heaven so we are here just temporarily no matter how many decades or years we live on this earth many people think that these are um, the duration is very long however when you look back when the time has passed is very short when i actually count my years i wonder how did the time just go by so quickly it was almost in an instant it's as if you look at your whole life in an, in a panorama and it says in psalm chapter 90 it says that we finish our years like a sigh in a moment's notice our life passes by so don't think that your life is will be long and if you just endure for a little bit longer that we'll meet our lord whether we are able to serve god up in heaven we'll be able to meet him for sh surely and then we'll enter the kingdom of god i'm actually quite joyful just the thought of that either ways when we became a born again christian and received salvation don't think of it lightly we are not just a church goer religious person there are so many religions in this world there's buddhism hinduism and muslims there's many dynamic religions out there and many religious people and then there's also church goers for those who have yet to receive salvation uh, what else can we call them but churchgoers so when you finally truly receive salvation you become a child of god and a true christian and then you are a inheritance you are an heir of god's kingdom so when we become a child of god and receive salvation we need to uh, think about how amazing that fact is just don't think of it lightly if you don't think about it properly, then that person's tr uh, life will not be able to live properly for God. So it's really, when you listen to a person's testimony, you, you, can, you can't really tell by a person's testimony whether they re uh, receive salvation or not because of their life isn't so sure. Our colors must be distinct, just like our lives. Just after receiving salvation, our lives must not follow after the lust of our flesh, but after the Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are it is an evidence one of the evidences of being a son of god and that is the spirit of god the holy spirit they are one so being walking in the spirit and being led by the spirit is the opposite of being led by the your carnal flesh you need to think about whether you yourself is being uh, you are being led by the Holy Spirit or your carnal flesh so whether some people are not uh, they they are emotionless when it comes to this matter if you look at a bat flying sometimes it looks like a bird but sometimes it may look like a a mouse you know and they're 
the color is very is um indistinctive so it's very unsure it's on the fence of whether it's a bird or a mammal right so we need to start uh, studying in detail and learning about what it is to be led by the holy spirit so what is the reason why we go to school and, be, and are educated? Some people might say this. So what does it matter what kind of education I get as long as I am able to find a good job and earn a lot of money? Some people might say who some parents who have a or are well off and have a good business, all I have to do is just um, and give and inher inherit all these things to my Children, why do I need to have them go through all the hardship of going through school? So some people actually do not send their children to school. What do you, what do you think about that? So is school a place where they learn how to earn money? So if there was a way, so are you saying that there, if there's a way to earn money, that you should not send your children to school? There is a purpose for sending your children to school. It's allowing your children to grow and develop properly and to build their personalities and characteristics, socialize. There are people who are well-educated. However, when you think of their who are very well educated. They went to um, a prestige school, but if you look at their lifestyle, it is just a mess. They're so foolish. It's because their their actions are foolish. They have no manners, and they say whatever they like, and they act however they wish to. People look at that person and said, "Oh, he is uneducated." However. There are those who, because of economic reasons, they aren't able to go to school. But later on, they became uh, tremendous people. And just look at Abraham Lincoln, who actually grew up in a log cabin. He was so poor that he wasn't able to go to school. But look at him. He became one of the most famous presidents. And there are many, many people um, with similar examples. How about... Uh, D.L. Moody, who was the most famous evangelist in the United States, he actually did not graduate elementary school because he was extremely poor. His family was extremely poor. He was so poor that he went next door neighbors. In order to eat, he worked and did their chores for them just to gain a little bit of money to survive. But he worked so diligently, regardless of his situation and therefore he became a worldwide evangelist but moody he he understood he did not have any knowledge or he was uneducated so therefore he in his hometown he built a house and therefore so for a long time he stayed in his house and studied and tried to earn education even if you don't Go to school, you'll probably gain an education. However, one of the re you know one of the reasons to go there to school is to be taught by teachers and to socialize with children, other students, your peers, and you can gain something from that. And you are you are trained how to become a decent person. What can you earn by doing things alone? It's very difficult. So the purpose of being educated is to become a well-rounded person, right? So if you become that person, all things will fall in place by themselves. There's a person who I know who is a professor at Yonsei College Universe who is a very well... Uh, it's a very well prestigious university in Korea. And this person is over 100 years old. He's still teaching at a very old age. But he believes in God. I'm not sh 
I'm unsure whether he is born again. However, when he was, he said that when he was younger, he had a disease where he was going to die. But he prayed to God, and he said that if I am cured of this disease, I will spend the rest of my life serving you. So, so I personally had a similar situation、um, experience as well. So, this person said, "A person who made me and cured me, God who helps me, so my even my body does not belong to myself." So, his the purpose of his, the purpose of why he lives, he says, that is not to earn money or to live for yourselves. It is to serve God. Is not to gain funds, gain money here. You know, if I live for God, then all those things that I need, God will provide for us. Oh, I, I truly believe that his belief of God is for sure. I I, re- I think that this man is re- truly determined to serve God. If our purpose. For serving God is determined, then God will surely save us in our both physical and spiritual states. So many people are foolish by living living to gain materialistic things, be economically well off. There are many people who say that I'm, I, they are very satisfied to living their life to gain、um, physical. Blessings, but if we first seek, but if we seek seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. All we have to do is obey God's word. You know, we should not worry about whether what to eat or what to drink or what to be clothed with, for God has already prepared for these. Prepared those things for us.、It、says Matthew chapter ten verse thirty says, "But the very hairs of your head are all numbered." By God, God knows our situation more than we know our current situation. God is able to take care of all those things for us. So why do we have to worry? If it's God's will, we we can live. But it's God, if it's God's will for us to die, then why worry? If it's God's will, if it's not God's will, we should not do those things. Should we live according to their own? Uh, benefits, but if it, in their own comfort, you come to church and they say, "Oh, today's sermon was really good," and you go back home and live according to、um, the way you wish, not according to the words. Is that right? Sorry, this might seem like I'm nagging, but we really need to examine ourselves and look back at ourselves. Am I living a proper life as a Christian and as a son of God? If Christ is in me, this is not just some kind of theory, but it is true. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And in First John chapter two verse six, it says, "Who he who says he abides in Him ought himself." Also, to just to walk just as he walked. We need to walk according to how Jesus Christ had walked. So we know how Jesus Christ walked, and is recorded in the Bible. And the and Christ who is in us tells us and guides us how to walk, and through our quiet prayer and through God's word will tell us how to. And we should not. Think twice about obeying His word. We must not, right? We must not disobey. We must not say no, no. But if you continue to say no, then God will just tell us to just, hey, just all right, go ahead, do what you want. We should not be like that, correct? The life of a Christian, we need to be walking on thin ice. Watch each and every step we take. Psalm chapter one nineteen verse one thirty three. It says, "Direct my steps by your word, and let no iniquity 
have dominion over me. In each and every step, we need to be led by God's word. So therefore, we can let no iniquity have dominion over us. And in us, we have our old man, our old personality, which is our flesh. No matter where you look in this world, each and every corner of this world, the sin is abundant and you can see the work of the devil. Just like Jesus sent his disciples, he said, I send you out as lambs among wolves. If the lambs dwell among the the carnivores, the predators, and wolves, what do you think would happen to them? Would they be eaten? Not if the Lord is protecting them. Just as David, when he was hurting the shepherd, his father's sheep, what did he do? Did he just lie in wait and run away when those predators were trying to eat the sheep? No. He followed after the lion and bear, you know, do you think Samson was the only one who fought the lion? No, but David, when he was a young man, a young boy, fought the lion. He took the lamb out of the mouth of the lion, and while that, that lion was about to attack him, he killed that lion. So even when David went out to to fight Goliath, even Saul looked at David, he saw that little child, but David, even though Saul's generals were trembling in fear, David said, did you leave this man alone? Oh, it's a tremendous bravery and courage. But, but Saul, saw David and thought that he was only a child. But David, but the Goliath, on the other hand, he was a as he was born a a warrior. He was extremely like a like a beast, like a like a ferocious monster. But what did David say? Your servant has killed both lion and bear. The Lord who delivered me from the lion and the bear will deliver me from Goliath. He told Goliath, he said that God is going to protect me from and deliver me, deliver me from Goliath. And because of his experience, he was able to go in front of Goliath. He did not look at Goliath, but actually he, he, he sought and looked after God who was with him. He knew that God was able to destroy Goliath. All he did, we know the story, right? All he did was throw a, a smooth stone and it struck Goliath directly in the forehead and he fell to the ground. And therefore, Israel was able to gain the victory that day. So David is the image and the foreshadow of our Lord, the King of Kings, who is Jesus. Just like Jesus Christ had destroyed the head of Satan. And Jesus' victory has become our victory. Where does it end? Our Lord who was with David, the ability that was with David from God was still with us. We need to act. All these things can happen by faith. So why would we run away like a coward? In fear and tremble of the of Satan. So after we receive salvation, we are not just a religious person. We are a Christian. We are a child of God. Our Lord is with us. Although the lambs are among the wolves, who can attack them or devour them when the Lord is protecting them? So therefore, the life of a Christian says 
John chapter 14, verse 20 says that, That day you will know that I am in my Father, and, not, and you in me, and I in you. you. We need to acknowledge that Christ is in us. And Christ dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is whom protects us and guides us and is able to, in the appropriate time, to reveal His words and guide and reveal the words to us and guide us appropriately. So therefore, being led by the Spirit is such a thing that exists, so therefore we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's why it says, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit. In these short, in this short verse, there's so much to learn from here. In Ephesians, it is, is a an epistle sent to the Christians at Ephesus. It's not towards all the drunkards. It's not telling us to stop drinking. No, it is a Letter to born-again Christians. Why? Because there are born-again Christians who could be drinking. There are those who drink as a habit. You know, if you drink one or two glasses, and all of a sudden you end up being drunk. So you can, for those who drink... You hear them talk about they enjoy drinking because they like being drunk. It says, do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. And just in case, if there are born-again Christians amongst us who enjoy drinking, they need to repent and stop. For those who drink, they can never be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because being drunk and being filled with the Holy Spirit are 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 antonyms. They are the opposite. They are worlds apart. Dissipation is living a life of not being, uh, not having self-control, just living according to however you want and your comfort and your desires. And in a previous verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. For those who live in this world, who are worldly, are those who are being past feeling. You know, when they, when they sin, they do not feel any guilt, and so therefore they, are, they do not have any feeling. Do you know about leprosy? You know, even if their nose falls off or their phalanges, their fingers fall off, they cannot feel anything. When I was in Tegu preaching the gospel, there was one of the brothers there that worked at the public health there. And those members of the public health, they once in a while go around trying to uh, find uh, people find lepers there are actually people uh, many lepers who do not realize they have leprosy you know they do not go around um, finding criminals but they find um, patients who have lep leprosy but they are able to just look at a person and just see if there's something wrong with a person whether their face on one side is slouching uh, more than the other maybe their eye or their cheeks or lips they, they're able to find people so when they go to the market, they, they look at somebody, oh, that person looks a little odd. So they, they, they pull the person to the side, and this person thinks that they are detectors or something. So what, so the, the public health members ask the person, hey, what's, what's wrong with your face? Why is it like the, the way it is? How long has it been? Um, I'm not sure. It's been a while. So then the public health members pinch and squeeze the person's skin, and they ask him, does it hurt? Actually, I don't know. I can't feel anything. 
Oh, they're, they know right, right then and there that he has leprosy. And he says, come to the public health office. And he asks, why? He said, well, you have leprosy. And they are surprised because they don't know. You tell me what? Uh-oh. They, they don't want the, the rumor to spread that they have lepr- leprosy. And they tell them, if you don't show up to the office, we're going to spread this rumor. So they're not able to do anything because they don't want the rumor to spread. So therefore, they, they, they tell them, don't worry. We're going to uh, admit you to the hospital and treat your condition. Do you know that they say that you know, if you treat leprosy quickly um, in its early stages, they're able to actually um, treat athletes. Um, it is able to be treated quicker than athlete's foot. So the distinguishing feature about leprosy is that they do not have any feeling. So in our hearts, if it becomes like a leper, no matter how much we commit sin, we cannot feel anything. It says, you know, being... Being drunken in dissipation means that you are doing things without any feeling, any guilt, drinking whatever you want, just yelling. You know, and, and then you're also committing sexual immorality. You start gambling. You're living a life without self-control. So, it says, to work all uncleanness with greediness. They have so much greed in them. And even Christians who are born again, if they're not careful, they can live in dissipation. And that's why being drunk is the beginning. Drinking is the beginning of dissipation. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 30 the 31, it says, talks about those who are drunk in wine. You know, in the beginning, a person, there's a saying, and a, per, a person first drinks alcohol, and eventually the alcohol devours and consumes the person. The person, when they're drunk, you know, their their eyes are not stable. They start living in the on top of the mast because they're so courageous, and they're just out of control. They start saying things that they normally do not say. They became very courageous and bold and just commit sins without any care. There's so many people who commit sins while they're drunk. There are many people who drink and drive and kill people. They can kill themselves. If you drink, you know, the, you know their drunken state gets a hold of a person and they're out of control. For those who enjoy being drunk, become ruined. Not just just, just their life, but their, their body, their liver, their whole families. That's why it says, do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. If you become drunk, you know, you start seeing weird things and then you also... But well, as Christians, we must not doing those must not do those things. So just because I mentioned about being drunk, I'm gonna you know we know that they are not in their normal state. Even a normal person who is normal, when they start drinking, they could start becoming a lunatic. They start. Um, Destroying their household, abusing their spouses, lose their lose everything they have. When I was in a different church, uh, there was a sister who had a husband that was um, he was suffering from alcoholism. He was addicted to alcohol. But when you when I heard about his story during the Korean War, he actually. Um, killed a lot of people during the war and so therefore 
a lot. He he drinks because he wants to forget the images of the war, the the people who he killed. So therefore, when he drinks, it actually all those images, those flashbacks come back. And one time, he actually went into the Buddhist temple for for a while and and tried to quit drinking. So he was actually able to pray up there for 40 days and so therefore he actually for 40 days he succeeded so for after 40 40th day he celebrated by taking a drink but then he just relapsed and ruined everything and so this man could not do anything to cure his alcoholism so therefore um it was impossible for him to come out of it you know i've seen many people it's almost impossible to uh, be cured to come out of alcoholism that's how severe it is so therefore i just i told this husband just from now on do whatever i tell you to do buy a a bible of your own and daily come see me daily and we'll learn the study so therefore this man he took time off he took some vacation he, he came to me daily to learn the bible and had counseling so therefore, finally, he was able to understand the gospel. And this man changed completely, 180 degrees. So the Lord came into my heart and he became a new man. If that person like this exists, so there are people who, even after receiving salvation, are able to, um, they start drinking alcohol. And that is the beginning of dissipation. Please do not do those things, okay? I'm asking you. And there are some people although they are not drunk with wine or alcohol, they are drunk in um, money and currency. In Luke chapter 12 verse 15 it says, "Take Heed and be hair of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So, covetousness, coveting, causes people's eyes to just go crazy. All they think about, whether they sleep or alive, is, is money. So, we ask the person what the sound of a bike changing gears when it passes by. Oh, what is that sound? Oh, that? It sounds like money dropping. Cha-ching, cha-ching. So all they think about is money. There are people who go mad about money. Wow. They just go crazy. Whether, whether they're asleep or awake. All they think about is money. And 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says that, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith, in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Even born again Christians can seek and desire money and live after money. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness, be content with such things as you have. It says, For Jesus had said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It says, God will never leave you and he will protect you. So why are you lovers of money? You must, if you live an appropriate life, a diligent life in front of God, then God will provide you. If God wants you to be abundant in riches, then you'll be rich. But if God wants you to be poor, then you'll be poor. That's God's will. But many people try to do whatever they want, um, when they're, whatever they can, even to go astray from their faith to gain money. So all they think about is money. You need to awake from those things. Do you live for those things? Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Who does that belong to? Does it belong to you? There are so many Christians who aren't able to... Um, Live properly. They're just out of their mind. There are many people who 
gain the lottery. They buy so many. They buy the new. Or, or uh, my apologies. Uh, there's so many people who who live according to whatever they want. They buy their clothes, abundance of their um, houses. They travel everywhere. They live so much in luxury on this earth. So then I ask them, why, why, why do you, do you then have a need to go to heaven? No. We as Christians have suffering in this world. We need to have um, hope in our suffering. Why should we seek after the pleasures of this world? Whether you are awake, when you are awake or asleep, what do you desire? For those who... desire after riches will go astray from the faith. They'll leave the Christian life of obedience, of serving God in their faith. The born-again Christian, if they have that kind of heart, then God will certainly not let them alone, leave them alone. I've seen uh, very uh, quite a few brothers and sisters that... Of like that, they they try to um, they earn lots of money. They actually end up do uh, are successful, but not. But shortly afterwards, they completely go bankrupt. But there are people who who try to. To do whatever they can to live according to they what they want, they they act spiritually at church. However, when they go, all they do is try to live according to they want. I feel like God could just blow it away. <sighs> Sorry, that was kind of weak. If God blows the money, God said He was going to blow everything away. That all those things they possess can can disappear in a moment's notice overnight. Do you think it's proper to live according to your own will? Do you think God will just leave you to be? We are already those who are in the grasp of God's hand. Whether we live or die, we are in God's hands. We must never forget that fact. For the riches, or for, or for the desires of this r- world, will ruin a person. Just as Apostle Paul said, "For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content." And he said, "He has learned both to be full and and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need." You can tell a person by their their worth in their Christian life. It's easy to tell a person's level of faith. Just give them a bag of money, whether it's a million, ten million dollars. You know, there are people who actually, uh, for fun, went to buy a lottery ticket, but they won the lottery, and they won they won a billion dollars. So even if they remove all the taxes from that they still have multiples of hundreds of millions of dollars so now all of a sudden they're carefree so what would happen what would happen if a christian did that they would just continuously buy they would they would continue that no, i'm sorry they would buy the best houses give their um, apartments to each of their own children they would buy the best uh, and new Cars, new clothing, the best clothing, they would best all the best things, whatever they can, whatever money can buy. And if it was a man, he would probably replace their old wife too. Sorry for saying that. But there are actually those people who do that. They don't, they don't work. Oh, well, there's actually no need to work. So therefore, if you receive money all of a sudden, just like it says 
in Proverbs, it says an inheritance gained hastily at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. The, f- the inheritance gained by your own diligence and own work and labor is what you'll be able to gain. But however, money that's given to people freely, they'll be ruined. What about Christians? What if, what if God gave you all this funds, right? God allows you to be abundant and also poor. So let's say if God gave you those things, we need to calculate and account properly. Do you, did God give you those things to live for yourself? God, I'm sorry, we must live only the bare minimum that we need. David had said that, but so in order to build the temple, he gave all of his possessions, the jewels, the gold, gave it all to the Lord for the building of the temple. And just like his, and his people did also. And therefore that is how Solomon was able to build the temple. And David Pray that, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all these, all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. For we are aliens and pilgrims before you, and all we are doing is rendering back to you what you have given, rendering back with a willing heart. Wow. David was an amazing man of faith. But is that special? This is actually a normal Christian who's doing that. No matter how much we have in our possession, do you think that belongs to you? People try to hold on to those things until their death because they think they it belongs to them. There's actually some people There are those who lots of possessions, whether they are rich or poor, you are actually being a good steward of the resources that God gave you. A steward is a person who who takes care of what their master had given them, right? Our health, our youth, our possessions, our materialistic things, whether we are in good health, They all belong to our Lord. So we must use those things and maximize the best use for those things for our Lord. And Americans, when they are alive, they actually, they donate to the church while they are alive, to charity and churches. And I heard that they don't they aren't taxed for those funds. It's because it's a donation, right? I've went to the United States more than forty times, not for pleasure, for leisure, but to for evangelism. Um but I'm unable to do so because of coronavirus. But they continuously ask me when I'm going to be coming to visit. But either ways, but through those, um, through that those times, I was able to go to a place called Asheville, and they have a church there. But not too far from there, they have a retreat center from one of the from the American Associate uh, the Baptist Association. Um, even though their their main hall wasn't as big, but their cafeteria was immaculate, and the places where they slept, it was almost like it was like being in a hotel. It was like massive amounts of condos, but the operating cost is quite um, expensive, so therefore they charge a lot. You know, they, they actually provide a lot of services. The ho- this rooms are like hotels, 
but that's not the reason why I mentioned thing, this. But each time I visit, it seems like they're renovating or constructing, have has new construction. So I asked them finally, um, how are you able to do this with what kind of funding? They say that people actually donate to them. There are many religious people and Christians who donate. So in this world, I think that in this world that there are many Christians that dwell in the United States still. There are people who when they um, when they pass away, they give all of their possessions to uh, donate to charity, but also to this association. So some people do that as well while they're alive. And it's it is very well established in the United States for donating. So therefore, because of that, they receive a lot of donations. So therefore, they're able to um, continuously renovate and build new things. Oh, I was actually envious. I was wondering, oh, how nice would it be if we had some kind of place like that? So we tried to build a retreat center similar to that. We So we don't need to be as um, prestigious as that. However, uh, we made it very similar. So if you look at all the workers at this retreat place, they're actually all elders who are there. And I ask them, "Who? Why are you here? And or or what is what is your story?" But they're there because they are willingly offering their free services and volunteering. So if the place offers a free bed or free food. They just come there and eat, or I'm sorry, um, work there for for basically a place to sleep and food. Oh, I was actually really thankful, but also felt bad because why aren't we able to do these things? But one thing I wish to share with everyone, uh, many years back, there was an old man went came in a wheelchair to KBS television network. He had um, many millions of dollars and he went to KBS. He donated to KBS saying that he wanted to donate to a charity to for, for little children who are orf- orphans, live without parents. He wanted to donate to the, those uh, households Please use these things, this this um, these this money towards them. He he has two children, and he gave them small houses, but no no more than that. But why was he able to do that? It's because his father told him, with all your inheritance and your money, don't think about giving them to your children. Give to the poor. You know how many poor people out there that need it more than your children? That was the will of his father. So therefore, his son, the rich man who was in the wheelchair, fulfilled his father's will. This man wasn't a person who who believed in God. A person who's going to hell. I wonder what could have happened if this man believed in God and was able to use those funds towards So when I think when I look at these people, I'm actually ashamed of myself. And there was a person, a a elderly lady who was in Tejan. She she earned and saved so much money while she was working, but she she saved money, and she was very. She did she liked she did not spend money on herself, but she actually donated all her money to a college research. And they actually made a monument for her. She was very frugal on herself, but abundant with spending the, with charity. So I saw another newspaper. It says, you know, um, in Hong Kong, the action uh, movie star 
Jackie Chan. He has so much money. He has lots of possessions and money. He had even his children. His actually his son is a movie star. But he said Jackie Chan said that he will he will not give his money. His inheritance to his child, so he donated all this fortune to charity rather than his son. He said he's already given so much to charity. However, he has actually pro- proclaimed those things. Wow, this this man. Even a person who doesn't believe in God is able to do those things. Even. This man, he's a he's a Jew. Bill Gates, he is a worldwide rich man, but he also enjoys donating to charity. Either ways, we as Christians, when we compare ourselves to them, we are all, of course, we are we are all in poverty poor compared to those people but even in our poverty we must do those things and so when we do face our lord the things that we've been given us we must not go let them go to waste we must give all those things to our lord so that's why i mentioned these things so before you pass away even though our churches are small even though we have a small place when i let's say if i live alone you know you must not you know just go, when you go home, you have you all have notebooks at home. So when you go home, write in a note that I want to give all my possessions when I die to and my inheritance to the church for the for the preaching of the gospel. You know, and I hope that since your all your family members are Christians, born again Christians, they'll all understand. But when you pass away, so I've seen so many times when family members of people who pass away they fight and bicker about who's going to uh, gain the inheritance to fight over the inheritance and even in luke it it says uh, there was a man who asked jesus to tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me So you you shouldn't, because of your inheritance, cause your family members to fight over this. So, so, in case you pass away due to some kind of certain accident, so whatever reason that could be, just tell all my possessions, my land, for the preaching of the gospel, I want to in, donate these things. So then all you have to do Write your will, and all I have to do is just go to a public notary and get it notarized. So if you get it notarized, no one is able to dispute that. I really wish that our brothers and sisters are able to do this. So when you all of a sudden accidentally pass away in a moment's notice, then all those things, I'm sorry, um, if, you, if you do not do those things, all your family members will just come together like, leeches and bicker and fight over your inheritance so it's it would be good if you're able to donate while you're alive but good if you can if you can do that this is actually not what i was trying to say to everyone somehow we we're led here but i really wanted to say this but if we live with that proper heart i'm certain that god will be pleased either ways And that's why being drunk in money is the same as being drunk in alcohol. It's the same thing. You're drowning in your own desires. Just as Judas Iscariot, because of his desires for money, he sold his Lord Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Do you know the... 30 pieces of silver is the wage of a slave. Do you think Jesus Christ would be sold by a man? Judas did not sell Jesus. He sold his own soul. 
But because he had a conscience, he felt guilt and he killed himself because of his guilt and went straight to hell. He sold his own Lord, own spirit. And there are those who are drunk in money, but also there are those who are drunk in the opposite sex. When you get drunk with the opposite sex, they are actually not their right, not in their right mind. There's so many people out of their mind. They they leave behind their own spouses, they leave behind their own children, their family. So when a born again Christian does that, you actually have to really question their salvation. You have to the only way to find out is to go to heaven. There are so many people who are crazy about women, but also there are women who are crazy about men. That's actually madness. You don't know how mad people are because of the opposite sex, because of lust. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 11, it says, But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry. So, go, is marrying a sin? No, but marrying a non-Christian is a sin. Of course, remarrying a brother or sister for the purpose of living a better Christian life is not a sin. However, marrying someone who is not born again is a sin because of their lust. Because of that, they go wanton against Christ. And it says that for some have already turned aside after Satan. Even if they receive salvation, they are able to deny Christ, um, deny their faith, Cast off their faith and betray Christ. Because of what? Their lust of the flesh. Wow, that's crazy. So when they're drunk, they're not of their own mind. They're not their own self. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says, But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. All those who do not receive salvation will go to hell. However, the born-again Christians who do this, God will certainly judge them as well. Some people are crazy about and mad about honor and fame. What about political people who are, who are in politics? If you look at the people who are on politics, they'll do whatever they can to rise to the top. They, whether they're, they'll try to... Um, use all their funds, their people's support from their family, do whatever they can to rise to the top. If there's a brother or sister who tries to do, um, to be in politics, I'll do whatever I can to um, persuade that person otherwise. If you look at politicians, you know, of course, it would be nice if they can uh, rule and govern whatever position they are in through faith. However, that is very rare. And what about popular culture? Popular culture is what killed Jesus Christ. You know, some people say that, oh, I, I came to be in this position um, through lots of wisdom and faith, but is that really so? Please, born again Christians do not get involved in those things. Please, I ask you. So there are people who are who have greed for honor, right? Greed for food, sex, honor, good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise. Even the disciples, before receiving salvation, they asked who was trying to be more exalted. There are those, even after receiving salvation, that are out of their mind and seek those things. Who, those who have greed for honor or fame 
of our authority, they'll do whatever they can in any method to try to do those things. They are those who are drunk. So being drunk comes in various and dynamic ways. And they are addicted to all those things. That's why in Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 3, it says, Truly the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. Evilness is, in, is full of I'm sorry, men are full of evil, then all of a sudden they die. Many people are mad about greed, fame, the opposite sex, alcohol. But there's also people who are mad and crazy about hobbies. There are people who are crazy about sports and their own desires, about singing. They, they're people who start singing and, and they fall in a trance. And they trance and they, they fall into their own spell of comfort. And their lives are all reversed. They all are going mad. And Apostle Paul, when he was boldly witnessing of Christ, King Agrippa said to Paul, you know, much learning is driving you mad. All your learning is driving you mad. So Apostle Paul was a scholar. He learned a lot. He says, I am not mad. I am just speaking. But speak the words of truth and reason. It's because I want you to become altogether such as I am. But in other people's eyes, that person, Apostle Paul, was mad. But we, for the preaching of the gospel... We aren't mad for anything else, so therefore we are mad and dr mad ourselves, right? But, but we are mad for the proper thing. We are properly mad. It says, "Do not be drunk. What is for this is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit." So why did he say that? Because we are gathered and are led by drunkenness. In dissipation, we can be led astray, right? But when we're led by the Holy Spirit, we can work for Him and be work diligently by God. And there were apostles that were to um, were by Jews were told that they are drunk while they were preaching the gospel very boldly, and. Peter said, these are not drunk since it is only morning. Have you seen anyone drunk in the morning? It is a work of the Holy Spirit. So, so they look at the apostles yelling out very boldly, preaching the gospel. Are they drunk? Yes, they're drunk with the Holy Spirit. When they're filled with the Holy Spirit, you cannot fear anything. You won't be able to fear anything. They are very courageous. And now, even among Christians, born-again Christians, uh, there are two people among born-again Christians when, in God's eyes. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3, from verse 1. To three. From verse 1 to 3, I'll read for you. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal for where there are envy strife and divisions among you are you not carnal and behaving like mere men so the the christians at corinth the church of corinth they are born again 
So, but Apostle Paul is saying that I do not could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. But they are carnal people. They are people who are spiritual and also carnal. And there are babes and also like men. The people in the brethren in Corinth, they receive salvation. It's been a while since they received salvation. They're able to speak in tongues and do a lot of things. They had a lot of knowledge, but they did not grow. So for those who receive salvation for a while, they think they are spiritual. But but they are very carnal still and very they are like babes, they do not grow. And they are mistaken. And that was the state of the Christians in Corinth. The Corinthians. They are still babes. And I fed you with milk and not with solid food. You know, little babes drink milk. For, your, for you are still carnal, for there are envy, strife, and divisions among you. The people say, oh, I am of a, a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter, I'm of Christ. They were divided into four divisions. They had so much envy and strife. So how, so how could they not be those who dwell carnally? You know, they're so arrogant that they even were judgmental of Apostle Paul. They had so many issues with this church in Corinth. So the first letter of Corinthians were, was a letter for them to repent. And that's why the second Corinthians was sent to them. Because they repented. That's why the first two types of Christians, there are those who are babes who aren't able to grow after they receive salvation there are those who dwell in um, carnal. They are carnally, not spiritually. But there are those who actually grow, and there are those who dwell spiritually. Those who are spiritual, they are being led by the Spirit. But those who do not grow, they actually live according to their carnal desires. So there are two types of Christians. Let's think about this closely, because this... Um, is a very important matter, is a critical issue amongst us. Even after receiving salvation, my inner self tries to, to please our Lord. Our inward man is trying to please God, but my outward man tries to please Adam because it's... Um, it came from Adam. But many people try to fulfill the flesh of the lust. That's why, and they, we battle against each other. And in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. And we, those two things, fight with one another. So after receiving salvation, we live in duality. Because we have the old flesh and also the spirit. We try to live according to the spirit, but also we have this flesh that wants to live carnally. So we are on the fence of that. It's, it's actually quite dangerous if you're on the fence. And that's why it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, it says that if we say that if we have no sin, we deceived ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is a person who was born again. Some people might say, because I am born again um, and the Holy Spirit is in me, I have no desires to sin. I have no sin. What did you say? Even the most, one of the most holy and spiritual people, they still have 
sinful natureness. So if you are not careful, you never know when our sinful desires will just spring up. Even Apostle Paul, he said that, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Romans chapter 7, verses 22 to 23, it says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. So our inward man, who has received salvation, tries to live according to the law of God. However, our our old man the, tries to live according to the law of the flesh. So if our if our flesh is so strong and our inner man is so weak, we'll be led by our carnal desires. That's why Apostle Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, because we are so weak. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So when you're young and as a child, it says you think, speak, and understand like a child. But, and even a, so a child is unable to fathom and understand the things of a grown person. They aren't able to understand the God's word. If you understand God's word, then you must certainly change and transform. You must obey God's word. So some people don't even act like they listen or obey the word. All they say is, oh, today's sermon was good and nothing else. So the word is in one place, but they dwell in another place. That's abnormal. So these two personalities, attributes exist within us. That's why it says that those who are doers of the word and not hearers only. And that's why it says to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because we are deceiving ourselves. That's deceiving the Holy Spirit. So Peter told Ananias, the one who hid his whole inheritance and possessions, all he had to say was that his heart wasn't fully ready. Here's half and I'll give the rest when I'm ready, right? But he said that he gave it all because he was seeing everyone else around him. He wanted to be as spiritual like Barnabas, who exercised giving their whole possessions. But he wanted to be spiritual, right? But Ananias died. He says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie and keep back part of the land? So he just died on that spot, right? Then shortly afterwards, his wife came, not knowing what had happened, asked, if this truly was the price, she said, yes, yes, of course, that's the price. So how was it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband at the door. So therefore, she just died on the spot as well. So even if we just um, do the same thing of half the, half the price or the full, we won't die, Right? Because if if we if everyone if that was the case, then there was probably no one on this world that would live, right? Be left to live. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. We must not do those things, right? Okay, we must not deceive the Holy Spirit. We must not lie to the Holy Spirit. We must be honest and true. God, our Lord, I am so weak and lacking. But if you are, you must continuously ask God to fill your shortcomings and to become mature and to take off your childishness when are you going to dwell being a child? Let's say if you took a mass photo of everyone, you're in the, and you look at the photo, what is the first thing you, you look at? Whose face do you seek first? Your own face, correct? So when you look at your own face and it comes out well, oh, you say, ah, oh, 
the photo went off well, came out well. No matter what happens to other people, you do not care as long as your face came out well, right? Then you say, oh, the photo was good. So what about the Holy Spirit? Let's say he took the God's word, that is the camera, took a spiritual photo of us. What kind of image would we come out and how God would see us? There's going to be children, adults, children, people who are asleep or are awake. There are going to be so many dynamic images in what God sees. David was a man of God who had the heart of God. There are people who are who live a proper life, but there are th those who not. If, p if you p take a spiritual x-ray of people, you, c you can tell the state of that person, but however, we aren't able to do so. So in this world, does do you have to be extremely healthy and be well off and adorn yourselves with the world's riches? So you try not to live, uh, look so much in poverty or look so poor and try to adorn yourself. So why don't people try to adorn their inward self as well? That's why in... First Peter chapter 3, it says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward in appearance, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart as God sees you. I saw in a news magazine in China, there was a police officer in China. They wore these special glasses that are able to To find criminals, those criminals who commit crime, and and they're able to find those criminals even in a crowd that has tens of thousands of people. They're able to find those criminals. So, do you think they can find all those, uh, just those people? They can find all the the sins that they committed that is recorded. And I also read. Uh, in another news article, I don't think this is false news, but there was a taxi, um, a person who was waiting for a taxi, but a taxi just all of a sudden stopped in front of him. So, was, so the taxi driver asked the passenger, "Hey, did you st do you want to ride, or were you waiting for a taxi? So where do you want to go?" And the passenger asked, "Oh, there is a way we can find out." But the so how did the taxi? able to taxi driver able to understand or know um, what that what people wanted to do it's amazing what our technology has advanced and in psalms chapter 139 it says that god you understand my thoughts from afar you know my sitting down and my rising up even in Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 10 it says i the lord search the heart i test the mind even to give each one according to their doings. So God searches our heart and he tests the mind. So how is it possible that you're able to even think about hiding something from God? We need to think about what image we are in front of God. Are we a person who is spiritual or carnal? Am I a person who are a babe or is a man who is grown who is mature let's look at one more verse hebrews chapter 5 hebrews chapter 5 hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 let's look at hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. It says, and you have come to need... Uh, 
Verse 13, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. 14, but solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. This is a very similar lesson here. So even though those who listen to God's word and learn of God's word for a while, they should be teachers of the word. But yet, the people of Corinth, the Corinthians, were still babes. They weren't able to... They're saying they don't even know the basics, the principles. The, so therefore, they should continuously learn the basics and continue to grow. However, they're not able to do so. There's no no history of them growing. They just dwell in their own arrogance. They just it says that but solid foods belong to those who are full of age and they're unable to uh, they're only able to partake in milk. So we need to continuously understand the word. In order to grow, we need to understand God's word more. But there's people who always partake in milk and unable to receive and digest the solid foods. It says, In the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. When the word is a little bit harsh or strong, they aren't able to overcome those. So when in the winter retreat, so we we say things because we um, think that everyone is grown. So we say little strong words, but those who are weak aren't able to overcome those words, receive those words. They don't know what to do. So that person is only able to drink soup and able to, and drink milk and unable to partake in the solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And it says here, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You're able to discern both between what God's will and what isn't. Discerning both e good and evil, you're able to receive, re um, be refined by God. That, so what it means to be is a sense is exercised. When you look at little children, when they try to start walking, they, they actually fall, they... They hurt their knees. They bang their foreheads. And that's how they grow. As you grow, you, you receive hardship and training and you are refined slowly and slowly. So as we live in our Christian lives, we face hardship and trials and tribulation. So through those things, we are continuously refined and grow and able to dis discern between good and evil. So instead of following and chasing the lust of the flesh, we follow and be led by the Spirit. So in order to be led by the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But um, let's say, so after receiving salvation, we receive the Holy Spirit. But being born again, receiving salvation... Receiving the Holy Spirit is different from being filled with the Spirit. We need to continuously be provisioned and filled with the Holy Spirit. So next time, I'm going to continue with this lesson. So we're going to learn what being filled with the Holy Spirit is and how to be received, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a very important topic. So we're going to continue with this topic next time. But that is all for now. Let us pray. A merciful Father God. Thank you for loving us and saving us and 
separating us from this world. And in this remainder of this time, we ask that you be with us to protect us and also guide us. And we thank you so much for doing so, Lord. And we learn to be to walk in the Spirit and to be led and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Please help us to learn what it is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and not to be those who dwell uh, carnally and to be led carnally, but also be those who please you and to live according to um, and to pursue and towards your will, Lord, and to continuously have dominion over us through the Holy Spirit. And the remainder of our lives, please help us to be led and to for help us to rely on your 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 words, so that we may not be ashamed when we come see you, Lord. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.